Hello and welcome to Road to Tokyo. I'm Tracy Holmes. Over the coming weeks, we'll discuss the big news stories of the week, profile our medal hopefuls and take a look at the challenges facing Japan. Organisers were ready for it and now their COVID plans have been put to the test. Members of Uganda's Olympic team are in quarantine in Japan after testing positive. The team was only the second group of foreign athletes to land in the country with Australia's women's softballers arriving earlier this month. A Ugandan coach was the first case testing positive at Tokyo Airport. Eight other members of the team were allowed to travel on an overnight bus to their training camp in Osaka. Another of the Ugandans later tested positive. The entire team were vaccinated and had tested negative for the virus 72 hours before arriving in Japan. Uganda is currently battling a second wave of the virus. Well, the teams are arriving, but just who will they be competing in front of? Organisers and the Japanese government have agreed to a cap of 10,000 fans at events. But as ABC's North Asia correspondent Jake Sturmer reports, the spectators will have to adhere to strict rules. This is Japan's national stadium. Come July the 23rd, it's where 10,000 spectators will be filling the seats. But they won't be screaming, they won't be cheering loudly. They'll have to follow very strict rules, wearing masks inside the venue at all times and only being allowed to clap. Now, public health experts have raised concerns about the idea of having spectators uh, at the games. Last week, they released uh, a series of recommendations saying, and including that it would be ideal from a public health perspective if there were no spectators at all. But Olympic organisers are confident they can hold events with spectators safely, provided that all of the participants follow the rules, follow the strict rules that they've set in what they uh, call the playbooks. The athletes have to follow these playbooks and and uh, there are similar rules that spectators coming to the games will have to actually follow. Now, it's not necessarily the, the moments inside the stands themselves that has public e health experts worried. It's actually the in and out, people coming in and out of the stadium at this particular point as they go to train stations or they come across prefectures. That's where they fear that the infections could spread. The reaction from people here in Japan is mixed. Some are excited uh, at the idea that athletes will have some kind of atmosphere and some kind of excitement with fans in the stadium. Others are worried. The infection situation has eased off in Japan, although in the last week or so, the number of infections uh, has remained somewhat steady. So there is still a sense of concern and alarm about the COVID situation in Japan. With around a month to go until the game, Organisers will be hoping that uh, a series of quasi-state of emergency measures that are in place across Tokyo at the moment will be able to drive those infections down even further before the Games begin. Organisers have this week given us a tour of the Olympic Village, which will include a fever clinic for anyone with COVID symptoms. Around 11,000 athletes will sleep, eat and train in the village. Most rooms have two beds and it'll be up to each country to decide who stays with whom. Athletes have been told to eat alone and quickly while in the dining hall and to wear masks while training. They'll be tested once every day and if they do test positive or show signs of the virus, they'll be quickly isolated, assessed and treated. Well, five new sports will be introduced at the Tokyo Games, including surfing, skateboarding and sports climbing. Australian Tom O'Halloran booked his spot for the Games after winning the Oceania Championship. And Tom joins us now. Tom, congratulations once again on your spot. For the uninitiated, can you explain to us the three different categories of sport climbing? Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, yeah, so the competition climbing is made up of three different disciplines, speed climbing, bouldering and lead. Speed is basically a head-to-head -head race uh, against yourself and the competitor. Bouldering is um, kind of a, a series of smaller climbs that are a bit more explosive and balancey kind of a test, um, up to about five metres high. And then the lead climbing is tying in with the rope and you're climbing up a 45 degree overhung wall uh, for about 15 metres or until your arms explode and you fall off. <laughs> there was a lot of excitement around the fact that, you know, some of these sports like yours were making their, their debut and then suddenly that was put into chaos. How did that affect what you were doing for your job, your family, your training, etc.? Yeah, it was a chaotic year for everyone, really. Uh, um, in... 
in March when basically everything was kicking off, I did lose my job. Um, and this a couple of days later, they called off our qualifying event because um, we were booked in for March 2020 um, to try and qualify for the Olympics. So it was a pretty stressful few days, um, not knowing where the world was going to turn. Uh, but we were able to kind of keep it together, I guess, and um, the world pulled together as one. Um, We've all gotten through it and we had our qualification event in December uh, of 2020. It needed to happen by the end of 2020 for it to be a legitimate um, qualification event through the rules. Um, So, yeah, it was pretty amazing to be able to actually have that opportunity there to to compete and fight for a spot because it would have been just gut-wrenching for who all of us as athletes still put in so much work and dedication over the last few years in the lead up and then just have the rug pulled out from underneath us. So, Tom, uh, we've got a few seconds left with you because I know you've got a really tight schedule. You're still training. You're putting in as many hours as you can. Talk us through Tokyo and how you're viewing it because unusually, this never happens at an Olympic Games, you'll fly in, you'll compete and pretty much within 24 hours, you'll be flying back out, won't you? One of the things you look forward to with the games is the opening and closing ceremonies and that sense of a community coming together. Um, So we we will miss that, but at the heart of it, it is still a sporting competition. And for all the organisers and everyone that have put in so much hard work to be able to give us an opportunity to compete, it's going to be pretty special. And this being my first games, I don't really have anything to compare it to. So it's going to be special either way. It will be indeed. Tom, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks so much. Good news for the beach volleyball duo Maria Fay Atacho del Solar and Taliqua Clancy today with the pair officially selected for the Australian Olympic team. And Taliqua joins us now. Taliqua, well done. It probably didn't come as a surprise to you and uh, maybe your training partner there. But you've got your ticket, you've got your happy coat. What's the emotion today? Thank you. Yeah, just so excited and it's really nice just to to be in the moment, you know, we're always as athletes focusing on that, on getting that gold and and winning that medal, but it's nice to really just sit here with family and appreciate the moment. Tell me about that pressure that you have put on yourself, both of you, you and Maria Faye, you've been traveling around the world for years now. It's your second Olympic games you're going to, and you really do genuinely talk of a gold medal, don't you? There is no doubt in our mind that, that we have what we need and we had really good preparation and that we can go out and get the gold medal, but We love the pressure. That's why you want to put on the green and gold. So we're just excited to head over there now. And you've got a really good um, access, haven't you, to somebody that knows what it takes, someone who has won gold in your event at Sydney 2000. Yeah, Natalie Cook has just been an absolute star. She's been um, with me from my very beginning of my journey as a 15-year-old all the way to now. She's been a really great mentor for Maria Faye and I and, and also Kerry. We're just so lucky that, you know, we have that great inspiration and um, uh, mentors around us. And Taliqua, why beach volleyball for you? Was it always a passion of yours? Was it when you saw Natalie and her partner competing in Sydney? What was it? I feel so bad for Nat and she's one of my closest friends, but I just had to be honest with her. I didn't see the game when I, when I was an eight-year-old um, watching Sydney 2000, but I knew from that moment that I was going to be an Olympian. I knew it. I just, there was no doubt, but if you told me I would have been for beach volleyball, I would have, I didn't even know what the sport was, but it did not take me long to fall in love with the sport and I'm so grateful for the opportunities um, that it's taken me, it's taken me all over the world and it's now taking me to my second Olympics. Taliqua, great to have you and uh, all the best to you and Maria Faye. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, as we've heard, the Aussie athletes are in their final weeks of training and as Taekwondo champion Safwan Khalil shares in his Road to Tokyo diary, some sessions are more gruelling than others. Hello beautiful people. No, I'm not inside my bathroom. I'm not sitting on the toilet, I promise. I'm actually inside what we call the plunge pool, which is pretty much freezing cold water, which you have to stand in, in order to help with your recovery, bumps, bruises, any swelling that might creep up around the body. And that's what this week we've really had to amp up is our recovery because we've had some heavy fights over the week and 
some bumps and some bruises are popping up to say hello. So this necessary evil right now, this plunge pool is an absolute must. It's one of those things you have a love-hate relationship with. You love the feeling it gives you afterwards, but you absolutely hate going through the process. There's a spa just over there, which I'm dying to jump into, but I know I can't. I have to stay disciplined and do what's needed right now, which is this plunge pool. Next week, I start my heavy dieting, which I'm not looking forward to at all, but I'll let you guys know a little bit about what my favorite foods are and what I have to cut out next week. Thank you all, guys. Much love to you all. <laughs> now, Japan's population is getting older, and that's causing some real issues for the government. Let's take a look at what this ageing nation means for the country's future. Japan is selling more adult diapers than baby nappies. That's because it's ageing and shrinking. Over the next 44 years, it's expected to lose 38 million people. That's the same population as Afghanistan, Poland and Canada. You don't have to look far to see why. Like in many places, Japan had a post-war baby boom. Now, more than a quarter of Japan's population is over the age of 65. And that's expected to balloon to almost 40% by 2060. culture, accustomed to three-generation households, it's becoming increasingly difficult for children to look after their elderly parents. And as for aged care facilities, robots are being brought in because the workforce is simply not there. But that's only part of the story. Japan is also not having babies. In 2019, the number of births in the country dropped below 900,000 for the first time. <laughs> Over the years, the media has loved to blame the low birth rates on the otakus, men who prefer virtual relationships to real ones, the herbivores or grass eaters, young men who have no interest in getting married whatsoever, and the parasite singles, those who prefer to shack up with their folks. But Japan's sexless society is only part of the story. There are other reasons too for the low birth rates. The working hours are long and not exactly family friendly. Wage increases and promotions tend to be awarded to those working overtime. It's also culturally frowned upon to leave the office before the boss does. Employees are often expected to join their colleagues for drinks after work. This is known as nomikai. And if you need any more proof it's hard for workers to get away from the office, just look at Japan's young fathers. Men are eligible to 52 weeks of paternity leave in Japan. But only 6% of fathers went on paternity leave in 2019. And most of the ones who did took less than two weeks off. Former Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi's son copped some flack recently when he became the first cabinet minister to take a fortnight off. Japanese people are so overworked, there have been numerous cases of karoshi, which is the Japanese word for death by overwork. And as for working women, there are plenty of disincentives to have children. There have been numerous reports of matahara, the Japanese word for maternity harassment, this is where pregnant women face discrimination in the workplace. They are demoted or urged to leave their jobs. And if they choose to be working mothers, they've got long hours ahead of them because research has shown men in Japan and South Korea do fewer hours of household chores and childcare than in any of the world's wealthiest nations. At-home husbands are still a novelty in Japan. Japan has been rolling out multiple economic and workplace measures to encourage population growth, but until women feel they can have children and retain their jobs, Japan has a long road ahead. And that is the road to Tokyo for this week. Thanks for watching. I'm Tracy Holmes. See you next week.